The Beatles had taken their act to London, and Beatlemania was already taking England by storm. Tonight, it is Nightcast Extra. David Jackson takes us to London, and that musical explosion in our Beatles album. Listen, do you want to know a secret? To most of England, the Beatles had remained a well-kept secret, and London was certainly not prepared for them when they first hit town. Closer. Let me whisper in your ear. And when these sounds first drifted through the neighborhood of St. John's Wood from here inside Abbey Road Studios, well, the music industry was flatly not impressed. But a funny thing happened on the way to their first album, and it had nothing to do with their music. The personalities of John, Paul, George, and Ringo simply charmed everyone they met. People like Abbey Road recording engineer Hurricane Smith. Musical-wise, uh, what can one say? That there's not a lot there, but you got it, you you got to sign them because I've never seen anything like them. <laughs> I haven't seen anything like them. I've never heard anything like that repartee. That I think on stage was one way of sort of letting his own ego out, right. uh, communicating with the crowds. But off stage, sort of away from the public, uh, he was a fun, fun guy. The Beatles would soon take that combination of madness and music around their country, and now the reaction was beginning to be overwhelming. They were on top of the British music charts, and a new word was born. Beatlemania was here, on the streets, at their concerts, and even inside Abbey Road Studios. Here comes a lot of people, 10,000 people, uh, stopping the traffic down uh, near Abbey Road. Here comes kids climbing on the roof of Abbey Road, would you believe? What was happening was never more clear than on a Sunday night, a nationwide TV broadcast from London's Palladium Theatre. The Beatles had conquered their nation, and it began with a crack from John Lennon. The people in the cheaper seats, clap your hands. And the rest of you, if you just rattle your jewelry. stopped rattling from that performance here at the Palladium when the Beatles suddenly found themselves England's biggest stars almost overnight. The band members themselves couldn't believe it, but their manager Brian Epstein could, and he knew there were bigger markets yet to conquer. And the time was now right. So 20 years ago today, the Beatles boarded a jet here in London for New York, and the wildest chaos ever seen in the world of entertainment. You might remember it, but tomorrow, you'll get a chance to relive it. From London, David Beatles Black. dropped on New York City like a bombshell, launching their first American tour. Tonight in his Nightcast Extra, David Jackson tells us how a special stop on that tour became one of the most memorable TV events ever in our Beatles album. They were waiting for the Beatles on the ground at Kennedy Airport in New York City. They were waiting on the roof and in the streets as the most famous band in England flew across the Atlantic. The only other family member to leave England with the Beatles 20 years ago was Cynthia Lennon, John's wife, who now lives in seclusion here in Pusey, a small town in southern England. I spent about an hour with her new husband, who said they're constantly being staked out and bothered by the British press, who will watch the house and try and get a quick picture of Cynthia coming or going. And he also said that Cynthia remembers that flight 20 years ago today as being tense and jittery. The band had no idea what their American reception would be like, but they were soon to find out the true meaning of Beatlemania. The Beatles couldn't believe it. America was ready to love them from the moment they arrived. This is very rarely seen film of the Beatles' first night in New York City and the non-stop Beatle party that was already in full swing. While their 
own songs blared from every radio station in the country, they danced with disc jockey Murray the K, forever known as the fifth Beatle. On this night, he was their host. But the full Beatlemania hit 75 million American homes on Sunday night of that wild week when Ed Sullivan brought the Beatles into our living rooms. The Beatles! Tim Kiley, who had spent years with Ed Sullivan, was a director on that show and called that night the most exciting, the most electric of his career. He right. certainly had no idea that the, of the reaction of the young girls, the shrieking, the fainting, the throwing jewelry, the tears. I mean, it, it, was, it was quite a scene. Vince Calandro, a production assistant that night, couldn't believe the reaction. Just the immediate reaction was just incredible. And, you know, of course the ratings proved it. I think the next day it was, I think, 74 million people had watched the show. And I think they even said that Billy Graham watched the show and he never watched television on Sunday. But for everyone who saw it, that night was special. Some, like Bay Area rock critic Greel Marcus, even called it the beginning of a revolution. Where every chord or every drum beat or every scream seemed to take on just incredible significance and be exciting beyond what you had ever expected music to, to be. The phenomenon began that night in February of 1964, and Ed Sullivan brought Beatles fans to a frenzied peak the next year in New York City. The machine was in full swing for their Shea Stadium show. This was the pinnacle of fame. No one had ever climbed this high. Honored by their country, decorated by their queen, Downtown streets were jammed under the Beatles' hotel rooms, but three Fremont girls slipped through the commotion for a brief meeting with the group. Tonight in his Eyewitness News Extra, David Jackson shows us all the local Beatlemania in our Beatles album. Close your eyes and I'll kiss you. The nationwide scream was still at full pitch when the Beatles hit California 20 years ago. They played this show at the Hollywood Bowl and headed up to the Bay Area with radio stations like KYA leading the way. In 1964, our general manager decided that every other record we played would be a Beatle record. So 50% of our music. I thought it was the worst idea I ever heard in my life and I said to him, that you can't do that. You can't do that and hold an audience. Our ratings went through the roof. It's been a hard day's night. The first Beatle movie, A Hard Day's Night, had already been released, and their momentum was incredible by the time the Beatles played the Cow Palace. Billy Mendez had the impossible job of making sure none of the girls got hurt at the Cow Palace shows. He knew Beatlemania would present special problems, but he says he really had no idea. The girls were just lined up, was one after another, just passing out. And <laughs> Stacked up on the floor. Yeah, just yelling Ringo, you know, and passing out. Like the Hollywood Bowl, little could be heard at the Cow Palace shows. The band was drowned out by delirious screaming. Paul McCartney remembers those shows. He told rock critic Ben Fontori San Francisco was special, but McCartney still doesn't like to reminisce about the Beatles. I remember, yeah, I remember the Cow Palace, I remember Candlestick Park. I remember playing here and enjoying it and seeing one of the police motorcycle escorts coming off his motorbike as he went around the corner. I got a lot of recollections of San Francisco. It's a very nice city. And I wonder what the response is to what's left over of a sort of Beatlemania. Well, I don't really think about it myself, you know. Thousands of Bay Area fans packed those concerts for the Beatles at the Cow Palace, but three of the luckiest came out of this house right here in Fremont. If you'd been here 20 years ago, you certainly would have heard Beatle music blaring out onto the street, and you would have seen three girls who were about to have a dream come true. Pam Russell, her sister Sherry, and friend Kathy Anderson were 15 years old back then, fanatic Beatle fans, and determined to actually meet them. 20 years ago, Beatlemania for them meant very simply marrying a Beatle. Kathy would have settled for John or Ringo, and I was going to settle for either Paul or George. <laughs> we were going to go to England, and we were going to live in gigantic mansions. <laughs> Armed with a giant homemade Beatle bug, the three actually got past guards at the Hilton Hotel and got into the Beatles' suite of of rooms for a shocking meeting with four strangers. In your teenage fantasy, you know, you just 
you have conversations and you're on an equal level and you visualize yourself perfect and you know and all of a sudden <laughs> I'm sitting here <laughs> you know trying to talk to Paul McCartney trying to talk to Paul McCartney and not knowing him and that was the hardest part realizing we didn't know him Pam said the three were crushed that the Beatles were not what they had been dreaming about the moment was a major loss of innocence and one of many awkward moments for the Beatles themselves. The Beatles were now growing tired of the crowds they didn't know. What had begun for them as a romp was now becoming a grind. The music and magic that brought them together was now starting to tear them apart. In San Francisco, David Jackson, Channel 5 Eyewitness News, Nightcast. Of course, even after the dream faded away, the money kept rolling in. Tonight in an Eyewitness News Extra, David Jackson shows us more of the magic the Beatles shared and why it all slipped away from them. It's the final part of our Beatles album. Help, I need somebody. Through the years, the Beatles continued to top the music charts with hit after hit. Up the rice in the church where a wedding was being. But the level of Beatlemania would never again reach the heights of their initial invasion of America. They did their last live show right here at Candlestick Park, and it was not sold out. Disc jockey Gene Nelson was the MC. It was a very short show. It was less than half an hour. When they finally got on, they just did a few songs. They waved to the audience, a lot of flashbulbs, and jumped in an armored car, and that was it. The Beatles soon retreated to the comfort of Abbey Road Studios to do six more albums, music which would reflect the dramatic changes in the world around them and in their own personal lives. By the end of the tumultuous 1960s, the magic that held the Beatles together was gone. As a group, it was time to stop. Bay Area rock critic Ben Fong Torres believes the breakup was inevitable. Yes, it was all too much. That's all. It was just an incredible wait, nonstop, for many years. It just was overwhelming. There was nothing like it before, uh, except possibly Elvis. There are places I remember. John Lennon, of course, would pay the heaviest price for that fame. His murder in 1980, a tragic reminder of the past. But he left us his tremendous musical legacy. Some have gone, and some remain. His widow, Yoko Ono, now manages his quarter-billion-dollar estate, but they all shared the enormous commercial success. Ringo Starr now concentrates more on a movie career, but he still earns $50,000 a week from the music. We've heard very little from George Harrison these past few years. He has retreated into his palatial home outside London, refusing almost all visitors, including us. So George Harrison has made his intentions toward the public pretty clear. At the other gatehouse, he has a sign in more than a dozen languages saying, Get Lost using stronger terms than that. Just standing near the gate, we were immediately told to move across the street or the police would be called. As for George himself, he has reportedly now bought property in Australia as a haven against fallout from nuclear war. The island and properties are financed on George's estimated $80,000 a week income from Beatles sales. Without question, Paul McCartney's career has been the most staggeringly successful. He reportedly earns close to a million dollars a day, much of it from the Beatles, who we found are still loved. Yeah, I've got a few Beatles records, like, got, like, Tristan Shell and all that. And you really like them? Yeah. What do you think of the Beatles today? Brilliant. Yeah, excellent. Spot. Brilliant? Yeah, really good. Spot on. Honestly, seriously, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And when we remember the Beatles today, we remember the songs and the moments and the magic. The Beatles record label, Apple Incorporated, still handles the tremendous royalties from Beatle record sales. That was the reason for a meeting last month between the three remaining Beatles and Yoko Ono. They met to decide how to split the hundreds of... <laughs>
Corral this 4x4 and you round up the most powerful standard engine in its class. Independent front suspension and 8.8% truck financing. Head them towards the canyon. 8.8 annual percentage rate. You can save up to $1,400 depending on options chosen only from Nissan. Now get 8.8% financing on any new Nissan truck at your Datsun dealer. If my car doesn't get noticed, it gets traded. Just for you, the new 200 SX from Nissan. Your kind of car. Styled to command respect. Fuel-injected aerodynamics with headlights that duck the wind. Designed like nothing else on the road. The new 200 SX. Anybody got a road? Come alive, come and drive. Your Datsun dealer. The results of the Iowa caucus tonight at 11 on update. This is the NBC Television Network. You can NBC there, be Mr. Sanders.